This is section five of Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter One On Board a Warship. I was born at Wanstead in Essex, about seven miles from London, in the year 1798. My father, having died while I was young, I was, along with a brother and sister, left to the charge of my mother, who, marrying again, transferred us to the house of her husband, a carpenter by occupation, at Bladen, near Woodstock, and in the employ of the Duke of Marlborough. My father-in-law appeared to be in comfortable circumstances. He resided in a neat house, built of stone, shaded by a noble apricot tree, and ornamented with a small but pretty garden. This, together with another similar tenement, was his own property. To add to my satisfaction, I perceived that he was kind to my mother, and also to myself. With the country around I was equally well pleased. Fine farms, with large flocks of sheep quietly grazing on the hillsides, fields surrounded with fragrant hawthorn hedges, and old farmhouses with their thatched roofs and massive ricks, met the eye on all sides while cultivated gardens and numerous wild flowers added their charms to the scene. At Bladen my time flew very rapidly away for two or three years, until, like most children, I began to sigh for deliverance from the restraints of home. I had already left school, and being now about thirteen years of age, had been employed in the pleasure-grounds of Blenheim Castle. This, however, was too tame an occupation for a lad of my spirits. I heard tales of the sea from cousins with whom I had resided for a short time. My imagination painted a life on the great deep in the most glowing colors. My mind grew uneasy. And, in short, like many other heedless lads, I resolved on being a sailor. Finding my desire so strong, my kind-hearted mother made interest to have me taken on board a ship of war, a matter not difficult in those times and on the twelfth day of july eighteen ten i turned my back on the quiet hamlet of bladen and my face toward scenes of noise dissipation storms and danger my mother accompanied me in the stage-coach to london and then taking a boat we proceeded down the thames to a spot below gravesend where lay the macedonian the frigate on which i was to be put aboard need i say that when left by my mother on the deck of the vessel tears were mutually shed, and when the departing boat carried her from my sight, I felt like one alone in the world. On the morning after my arrival I was put into a mess. The crew of a man of war is divided into little communities of about eight each, called messes. These eat and drink together, and are, as it were, so many families. The mess to which I was introduced was composed of your genuine weather-beaten old tars, but for one of its members it would have suited me very well. This one, a gruff old fellow named Hudson, took it into his head to hate me at first sight. He treated me with so much abuse and unkindness that my messmates soon advised me to change my mess, a privilege which is wisely allowed, and which tends very much to the good fellowship of a ship's crew. For if there are disagreeable men among them, they can in this way be got rid of, it is no unfrequent case to find a few who have been spurned from all the messes in the ship obliged to mess by themselves. This unkindness from the brutal Hudson rather chilled my enthusiasm. The crew, too, by some means, had an impression that my mother had brought me on board to get rid of me, and therefore bitterly abused her. Swearing I had heard before, but never such as I heard there. Nor was this all. In performing the work assigned me, which consisted in helping the seamen to take in provisions, powder, shot, etc., I felt the insults and tyranny of the midshipmen. These minions of power ordered and drove me round like a dog, nor did I and the other boys dare to interpose a word. These things reminded me of what had been said to me of the hardships of sea life in a man of war. I began to wish myself back in my father's house at Bladen. This, however, was impossible, and to add to my discouragement, they told me I was entered on the ship's books for life. 
dreary prospect but although somewhat grieved with my first experience of sailor life i secretly struggled against my feelings and with the most philosophic desperation resolved to make the best of my condition we were kept busily at work every day until the ship's stores were all on board and our frigate was ready for sea then two hundred more men drafted from receiving ships came on board to complete the number of our crew which after this addition amounted to full three hundred men the jocularity pleasantry humor and good feeling that now prevailed on board our frigate somewhat softened the unpleasantness of my lot and cultivated a feeling of reconciliation to my circumstances various little friendships which sprang up between me and my shipmates threw a gleam of gladness across my path a habit of attention respect and obedience in a short time secured me universal good will i began to be tolerably satisfied many boys complain of ill usage at sea i know they are subjected to it in many instances yet in most cases they owe it to their own boldness a boy on shipboard who is habitually saucy will be kicked and cuffed by all with whom he has to do he will be made miserable the reason is i imagine that sailors being treated as inferiors themselves love to find the opportunity to act the superior over some one they do this over the boys and if they find a saucy insolent one they show him no mercy permit me then to advise boys who go to sea to be civil and obliging to all they will be amply repaid for the effort it may cost them to make the trial especially if they gain the reputation as i did of being among the best boys in the ship a vessel of war contains a little community of human beings isolated for the time being from the rest of mankind this community is governed by laws peculiar to itself it is arranged and divided in a manner suitable to its circumstances hence when its members first come together each one is assigned his respective station and duty for every task from getting up the anchor to unbending the sails aloft and below at the mess table or in the hammock each task has its man and each man his place a ship contains a set of human machinery in which every man is a wheel a band or a crank all moving with wonderful regularity and precision to the will of its machinist the all-powerful captain the men are distributed in all parts of the vessel those in the tops are called foretopmen main topmen and mizzen topmen with two captains to each top one for each watch these topmen have to loose take in reef and furl the sails aloft such as the topgallant sails top sails topgallant royal and topsail studding sails others are called forecastle men wasters and the afterguard these have to loose tend and furl the courses that is the foresail the mainsail the lower studding sails they also have to set the jib flying jib and spanker the afterguard have a special charge to coil up all ropes in the after part of the ship others are called scavengers these as their not very attractive name imports have to sweep and pick up the dirt that may chance to gather through the day and throw it overboard then come the boys who are mostly employed as servants to the officers our captain had a steward and a boy these acted as his domestic servants in his large and stately cabin which to meet the ideas of landsmen may be called his house the lieutenants purser surgeon and sailing master had each a boy they together with the two lieutenants of marines who were waited upon by two marines form what is called the wardroom officers the wardroom is a large cabin i mean large for a ship of course below the captains where they all mess together after this cabin is a smaller one which serves as a species of storeroom besides these accommodations every wardroom officer has his stateroom containing his cot washstand writing desk clothes etc the gunner boatswain and some others are also allowed a boy and a man and boy are appointed to be the servants of a certain number of midshipmen 
another arrangement is that of forming the ship's company into watches the captain first lieutenant surgeon purser boatswain gunner carpenter armorer together with the stewards and boys are excused from belonging to them but are liable to be called out to take in sail some of the last mentioned are called idlers all others are in watches called the larboard and starboard watches stations are also assigned at the guns to the whole crew when at sea the drummer beats to quarters every night this beat is a regular tune i have often heard the words sung which belong to it this is the chorus hearts of oak are our ships jolly tars are our men we always are ready steady boys steady to fight and to conquer again and again at the roll of this evening drum all hands hurry to the guns eight men and a boy are stationed at each gun one of whom is captain of the gun another sponges and loads it the rest take hold of the side tackle falls to run the gun in and out while the boy is employed in handing the cartridges for which he is honored with the name powder monkey besides these arrangements among the men there are from thirty to forty marines to be disposed of these do duty as sentries at the captain's cabin the wardroom and at the galley during the time of cooking they are also stationed at the large guns at night as far as their numbers run when a ship is in action and small arms can be brought to bear on the enemy they are stationed on the spar deck they are also expected to assist in boarding in conjunction with several seamen from each gun who are armed with pistols and pikes and called boarders the great disparity of numbers between the crew of a merchant ship and that of a man of war occasions a difference in their internal arrangements and mode of life scarcely conceivable by those who have not seen both this is seen throughout from the act of rousing the hands in the morning to that of taking in sail in the merchantman the watch below is called up by a few strokes of the handspike on the forecastle in the man of war by the boatswain and his mates the boatswain is a petty officer of considerable importance in his way he and his mates carry a small silver whistle or pipe suspended from the neck by a cord he receives word from the officer of the watch to call the hands up you immediately hear a sharp shrill whistle this is succeeded by another and another from his mates then follows his hoarse rough cry of all hands ahoy which is forthwith repeated by his mates scarcely has this sound died upon the ear before the cry of up all hammocks ahoy succeeds it to be repeated in like manner as the first tones of the whistle penetrate between decks signs of life make their appearance rough uncouth forms are seen tumbling out of their hammocks on all sides and before its last sounds have died away the whole company of sleepers are hurriedly preparing for the duties of the day no delay is permitted for as soon as the before-mentioned officers have uttered their imperative commands they run below each armed with a rope's end with which they belabor the shoulders of any luckless wight upon whose eyes sleep yet hangs heavily or whose slow-moving limbs show him to be but half awake with a rapidity which would surprise a landsman the crew dress themselves lash their hammocks and carry them on deck where they are stowed for the day there is a system even in this arrangement every hammock has its appropriate place below the beams are all marked each hammock is marked with a corresponding number and in the darkest night a sailor will go unhesitatingly to his own hammock they are also kept exceedingly clean every man is provided with two so that while he is scrubbing and cleaning one he may have another to use nothing but such precautions could enable so many men to live in so small a space a similar rapidity attends the performance of every duty the word of command is given in the same manner and its prompt obedience enforced by the same unceremonious rope's end to skulk is therefore next to impossible the least tardiness is rebuked by the cry of hurrah my hearty bear a hand heave along heave along this system of driving is far from being agreeable it perpetually reminds you of your want of liberty it makes you feel sometimes as if the hardest crust the most ragged garments with the freedom of your own native hills 
would be preferable to John Bull's beef and duff, joined as it is with the rope's end of the driving boatswain. We had one poor fellow, an Irishman, named Billy Garvey, who felt very uneasy and unhappy. He was the victim of that mortifying system of impressment prevalent in Great Britain in time of war. He came on board perfectly unacquainted with the mysteries of sea life. One of his first inquiries was where he should find his bed, supposing they slept on shipboard on beds the same as on shore. His messmates, with true sailor roguishness, sent him to the boatswain. "'And where shall I find a bed, sir?' asked he of this rugged son of the ocean. The boatswain looked at him very contemptuously for a moment, then, rolling his lump of tobacco into another apartment of his ample mouth, replied, "'Have you got a knife?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Well, stick it into the softest plank in the ship, and take that for a bed.' As our fare was novel and so different from shore living, it was some time before I could get fully reconciled to it. It was composed of hard sea-biscuit, fresh beef while in port, but salt pork and salt beef at sea, pea-soup and burgoo. Burgoo, or as it was sportively called, skilligalee, was oatmeal boiled in water to the consistency of hasty pudding. Sometimes we had cocoa instead of burgoo. Once a week we had flour and raisins served out, with which we made duff, or pudding. To prepare these articles each mess had its cook, who drew the provisions, made the duff, washed the mess kids, etc. He also drew the grog for the mess, which consisted of a gill of rum mixed with two gills of water for each man. This was served out at noon every day. At four o'clock p.m. each man received half a pint of wine. The boys only drew half this quantity, but were allowed pay for the remainder, a regulation which could have been profitably applied to the whole supply of grog and wine for both boys and men. But those were not days in which temperance triumphed as she does now. Shortly after our captain came on board, his servant died somewhat suddenly so that I had an early opportunity of seeing how sailors are disposed of in this sad hour. The corpse was laid out on the grating, covered with a flag. As we were yet in the river, the body was taken on shore and buried, without the burial service of the Church of England being read at the grave, a ceremony which is not omitted at the internment of the veriest pauper in that country. I have purposely dwelt on these particulars, that the reader may feel himself initiated at once into the secrets of man-of-war usages. He has doubtless seen ships of war with their trim rigging and frowning ports, and his heart has swelled with pride as he has gazed upon these floating cities, the representatives of his nation's character in foreign countries. To their internal arrangements, however, he has been a stranger. I have endeavored to introduce him into the interior. A desire to make him feel at home there is my apology for dwelling so long on these descriptions. End of chapter 1